All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here this evening. Um, we're talking about the truth about learning styles and why it matters for your child's success in school. My name is Ann Dolan, and for the last 24 years, along with my team of tutors, executive function coaches, and college consultants, we've been helping kids to do better in school and to ultimately get into the college of their choice. And one of the most important things we do here at Educational Connections is teach kids the most effective study strategies so that they're not necessarily studying harder, but they're definitely uh, studying smarter. All right, so as I mentioned, we're here to talk about learning styles this evening. And it's it, to me, it's so fascinating because for decades, parents and teachers have been told that kids have a particular learning style, that they're this type of learner or that type of learner. But actually, in more recent years, um, many studies have really debunked this concept of learning styles. And we know that nobody has just one style of learning. Um, and these little quizzes that kids often take, or that everybody loves to take a quiz, we all like to classify ourselves, um, those types of things that narrow down the type of learner you are, well, they're actually not that predictive of how you learn. So we know that although there isn't a particular learning style that each person has, we do know that kids can still have a learning preference, meaning that they may say, oh, I like to learn visually. I like to see what's going on. Sometimes students will say, I really get a lot from you know, a presentation or a lecture. They like to work in study groups where they're discussing. That's an auditory learner. And then the last type of learner is the kinesthetic type of learner. This is a student who likes to do hands-on learning. So um, I'd love to know where, how you classify your child. If you had to pick, you know, what type of learner or what type of preference does your child have? Are they auditory, likes to listen, visual, likes to read or watch, kinesthetic, more hands-on? How do you classify your child? So if you can go ahead and pick one of those, we'll take a look as to um, what people are saying. Ah, I see visual and kinesthetic are dueling it out. But definitely more people say kinesthetic. Interesting. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you so much to everybody who has participated. That's awesome. Um, so it looks like, uh, just to buy a nudge, can, most people say that they have a kinesthetic type of learner in their household followed right behind that at visual for 39%. And then last is auditory, kids that like to learn, that are like to listen. All right, so why does all this matter? Um, we know this matters because, let me get to the slide, sorry about that. Um, students can have a preference. So we still want them to know how they've learned well in the past, because that can guide them in the future. And what's the, when they understand how they do learn, a way that in which they do learn well, um, we'll teach them how to layer strategies on top of that. Because it's not just one way, there's lots of ways kids can learn. So tonight, I want to introduce you to Jennifer Gonzalez. Jennifer is an education specialist here at Educational Connections. And she has the unique responsibility of talking to parents every day. And it's not just a parent from the school and another parent from the same school, but her perspective is unique in that she talks to parents um, of ki from kids in all different grade levels across all different school districts and in different parts of the country. And once she gets a background on the child and talks to the parent, has that consult, she then figures out the exact needs of that student. She matches the student with one of our tutors, and then she oversees the child's program. So Jennifer really understands classroom trends and what's going on with kids out there. So I'd love for you to meet Jennifer. Jennifer, hello. Hi, Anne. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I'm glad that you're here. So I'm curious to know, what are some common trends that you're seeing with how kids learn? Great question. Um, one of the most common things that we hear are your remarks about a child's learning preference, things like 
Johnny loves to listen to audiobooks and replay the videos from his teacher, or Susie loves to take notes. She's always writing things down. Um, but, you know, as parents, I think that it's easy for us to observe our child's, you know, methods that are most comfortable for learning. Um, and I, in addition to that, you know, what I often hear is that students come in all varieties of, you know, and levels of motivation, uh, but they tend to fall into two camps. We've got kids that choose the path of least resistance and then students that are really hardworking and super conscientious and still missing the mark of where they'd like to be. Um, and what both camps have in common is that both are, they're underperforming academically. Um, and so, you know, all of that kind of boils down again to the learning preferences and study skills. You mentioned that um, you see kids that are actually working really hard, but they're underperforming. How does that happen? How can that be? What are you hearing? Yeah, great question. Um, a lot of that has to do with study skills and understanding how to layer on to our preferences and study well and effectively and learn some of the hard skills like note taking if we're not naturally note takers. Um, and so the backbone to a lot of that underperformance on exams and missing the mark narrowly is just the how to's. Thank you for that, Jennifer. And interesting, you bring up exams and testing. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because that is a very common piece of underperformers. Um, so kids that are working hard, but are, like you said, still missing the mark when it comes to testing. All right, next question for you. Um, based on conversations with parents, have study habits declined because of COVID? <laughs> question. Yes, they have. Uh, not a conversation goes by where, you know, parents are quick to recall how and explain how the last few years have impacted their children and their students, and rightfully so. Um, all of these disruptions, uh, they've, they've caused huge impacts on habits, um, you know, not least of which are the study habits. And um, when there's not regular practice, habits don't exist, right? So and we've seen this take a big toll, especially on cumulative subjects like math, um, where gaps in learning can cause a lot of stress on students and parents alike. Um, you know, and all your parents share, well, you know, Sam doesn't know how to study. And Sam says, I don't even know where to start. Um, and so this is certainly a conversation that comes up in nearly all of my conversations with families. We hear that a lot from parents too. Um, they're concerned about their child's study habits. Yes, for sure. Thank you for that, Jennifer. I'm going to come back to you a little bit later um, this evening, if you don't mind. All right. So that brings us to the question, well, what do we know about how kids learn best? If we know that um, there is no such thing as a learning style, just one unique learning style to each person, what do we know? Well, there's actually lots of research in how, how people learn, not just kids, but adults too. And in fact, if you're really interested in this, there's a wonderful website called Learning Scientists and it's learningscientists.org. Um, it's great for kids and teachers and parents. But um, on this website, they outline the eight uh, ways of retaining information that kids need to have. And then specifically, they boil down these eight strategies into the two um, strategies that are most meaningful, meaning that if kids use these two top science-based methods, they will perform well. So let's talk about those, and then we're going to dive back into learning preferences a little bit later. All right, so here's the first one. It's called distributed practice. So distributed practice is the opposite of cramming. Everybody has a crammer in their house. It's kind of human nature. You have a test on Friday, you pull out your books at the last minute on Thursday night to study. If you even do that, maybe not. Jennifer's talking a little bit, of, was talking a little bit about the path of least resistance kids. Um, they may just study for a short time or not at all. So let's say that the student studies for an hour on Thursday night for a big test. Well, if the student took that hour and instead divided it up to 20 minutes Tuesday, 20 minutes Wednesday, and 20 minutes Thursday, he will retain the information, not just for the exam the next day, but for um, a test or a unit exam, a midterm, a final later on. So we know that when you take mass practice 
and you break it up into shorter bursts over time, it helps your brain cement that information into long-term retrieval. So distributed practice or breaking things up over time is one of the best study habits kids can have. But above and beyond that is a concept called self-testing. This is actually the number one skill for retention of information. Self-testing is when basically you're quizzing yourself on the information. So I'll give a couple of examples. Let's say uh, this often happens in elementary and middle school, and sometimes maybe like ninth grade, perhaps 10th grade, where students are given a study guide and they fill in the study guide in class. They go over it or they fill in part of it and they're given the rest to take home for homework. And when kids are taking the path of least resistance, on Thursday night, they may pull out their study guide and read through it. And that's how they study. But actually, if they took that study guide and made two blank copies, um, filled out the first one as they do in class, and then the second one, they do it from memory. They fill in as much as they can, and then they ask themselves, what do I not know? And when they don't know something, they can look back at the original example to see if they're right or not. And if they can't think of it, they can just write it in at that point. And they do the same thing on the third day. This way, they're breaking it up over time and they're making their brain work hard. And that's what self-testing is. You're basically quizzing yourself, asking yourself the question, and then you really know it. You can also create your own little quiz or test, um, practice test, should we say. And this is especially helpful in math. This is the best way to study for math. So if the student has a test and they go back to practice problems that they've already done, maybe they've taken notes on these problems or they're in their book, for example, they make themselves, we're always teaching kids how to do this. Um, at first, we often will make the test for them and then we teach them how to do it. They might put four problems on their sheet and then they solve them the best they can. And when they don't know, what to do next, they can look back at the original, again, quizzing themselves. And we'll talk a lot about Quizlet later on, but Quizlet is a software that kids use to study and there are ways in which they can use it. So they are self-testing. All right, so as I mentioned, we if kids have a preference and when they come to us, they say, this works well for me, um, we'll have a discussion over it. In general, if they found that something works well for them, they're usually right. Sometimes though, they're off the mark and we'll have more of a discussion about how that is exactly working. But let's say it's accurate. So we'll encourage kids to start with their preference. Many of you said you had a hands-on learner or you had a visual learner. So that's where they might start. And then they're gonna add some layers to it. So let's start with the kid that's the auditory learner. So auditory learners love to learn by listening. And these are the kids that can sit in a lecture and be very engaged and take away information from that lecture. Um, so that would be the base layer of, of learning for that student, listening to a lecture. But if we wanna add something more to it, the next part would be taking notes. This is more visual and also kinesthetic. Many times we hear from kids I can remember what I hear. Another one we hear is, oh, I can remember what I have to do tonight. My teacher told me in class. Really, they, they typically cannot remember all of that information. So taking notes is vital. So we'll teach kids how to take notes. And one of the most helpful note-taking techniques that we've used, and there are lots of them out there. This doesn't mean it's right for all kids, but it's generally helpful to most students is called Cornell Notes. Cornell Notes is just a system of writing down the information. So instead of writing down everything, when the teacher is talking about something in a lecture, or they might be taking notes from the book, they write the key ideas or the terms on the left third of the page, as in this example, and all their notes are on the right two thirds of the page. This is helpful because now kids can self-test. They can either cover up the notes on the right with their hand and ask themselves, what are the four neighboring countries to Guatemala? And they should be able to say by memory, huh, 
Um, well, Guatemala borders on Mexico, Belize, Honduras. Oh, wait, what's that other one? I can't remember. Again, making their brain work hard. And then they can look at that answer. If they have a regular piece of paper, a physical piece of paper, they can actually fold over the two thirds with their notes and ask themselves the key ideas or the terms that are on the left. So I've taken something that's just auditory and I've also made it um, visual and kinesthetic through note taking. And now we've incorporated this concept of self-testing. It can be even better if it's done over a couple of days leading up until the exam. All right, let's say you also have an auditory learner who likes the social aspect of group study sessions. And when kids say they like study groups, we believe them because they're probably kids that um, have a preference of auditory learning and like that social aspect. And if they like it, we encourage them to keep going. This is a great idea, especially as kids get older. So it's one thing to have a discussion, but again, it's another thing to either take notes or an added layer could be to just make flashcards. That's another way of adding a layer. Flashcards are things that we used when we were kids. They're kind of old fashioned, but we know that they still work. So it shouldn't be that you're, that you're writing things on flashcards that you copy from a book. That's not helpful. Instead, it should be the term or the word on one side of the card. And then on the other side of the card is in the student's own words, the meaning, maybe a picture to help them remember. Here's another example, the student that likes to listen to audiobooks, or maybe they like to listen to a podcast. Well, we already know that that added layer could be writing something down. But for some kids, um, that they, even though they like to listen, they can be distracted. So if they're listening to something on their laptop, it's so easy to open up other tabs or to grab their phone. Um, so we'll encourage kids if they just wanna listen, to also doodle. Um, doodle. Doodling is something that is often frowned upon. You know, we think, especially, I already know when I was a teacher, I used to think if kids were doodling in my class that they weren't paying attention. But newer research has come out that's shown that doodlers actually um, retain slightly more information than non-doodlers. It's their way of keeping their brain active. So it could be that they're listening and they're doodling or they're listening and they might have a fidget toy like this. Um, I love these, by the way. They're one of the best selling fidgets on Amazon. All it is is a mesh little bag with a marble in between that kids can um, move around. And it, again, it helps keep the brain alert while you're doing something else. Now, let's shift and talk about kids that have a visual preference. So these are kids that might like to read, um, but we know, again, reading's good, but there has to be something else on top of it. One of the, um, one of the best study strategies for this concept of self-talk, self-testing is actually self-talk and asking yourself what's important. So often when kids read, if they don't understand what they've read, and in fact, I had a kid many years ago tell me, um, he did this all the time, they just keep on reading. Uh, I, re I was giving him a reading test one day, he was a 10th grader, and um, we were reading, and it seemed like he was just calling out words. And I said, oh, tell me about what you're reading. And he said, I don't, I'm not really sure. And I said, I'm just curious why you didn't stop and go back and reread. And he said, oh, because when I'm reading, I always think like, if I keep reading, it will make sense to me eventually. So I don't do that. Um, so we had a discussion about what's another strategy instead of keep reading. And the strategy, whether you have that issue or the, your base layer is reading, is to stop at the end of a paragraph, at the end of the page, at the end of the section, and ask yourself, what's important here? Why do I need to know this? What is important? And then on a post-it note or in the margin or using annotation on the laptop, jotting down just a few words, what's important. So it is kind of like a self-test. You're asking yourself the question, your brain has to synthesize the information and you jot it down. 
Now, we have a lot of kids that are highlighter happy. They love highlighters, but highlighters have not been shown to be effective as a tool for comprehension. And the reason is that often people, when they're reading something, they highlight as they go, but that's not effective. Instead, if you wanna ask yourself that question at the end of the paragraph and then go back and highlight, that's okay. Still, jotting it down in words is better, but if you don't wanna do that, you can go back and highlight it as well. Let's take the kid that will review the teacher's slides. So again, if they have a test, the teacher has put in the portal her copy of the PowerPoint deck um, or her slide deck. So the student might go back and might just glance through that deck and say they've studied. Well, another layer to that would be to take digital notes. So again, take the teacher's slide deck and in the notes section of the PowerPoint, um, after you've downloaded, add your own notes. Again, asking what's important. So you can kind of see a trend that you start with a baseline and then you're trying to quiz yourself as you go along. So kinesthetic learners, many kids are kinesthetic. They like to learn by doing. Um, many kinesthetic kids will are willing to take notes. They like to be doing something, um, but they may not always be super effective note takers. And that's why we encourage them to use Cornell notes. So regardless of how they take notes, they can also have the extra layer of doing something with their notes. Um, I found that a lot of kids actually do like flashcards and they're willing to take that information and jot it down in flashcard form. One of our tutors, Jan, who's been with us for almost 10 years now, and she's amazing. She's a full-time tutor and she, she works with kids nonstop. Um, but years ago, she showed me this technique. And so we taught it to many of the tutors over the years and, and it works like beautifully for kids. So basically it's called the Leitner system and you take your stack of cards and you have little boxes in front of you. Um, it, 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 honestly, now that kids, um, so many things are um, virtual, they don't always have boxes, but they can just put their cards into different stacks. So you start out with your stack of cards and you go through your stack of cards and you're quizzing yourself, what do I know? If you know the answer, it goes into the um, next pile. And basically each day you're asking yourself what you know um, and if you know it, it goes in the next pile. You quiz yourself on the next pile again. If you know it again, it goes in the next pile. So the reason that this is helpful is that you're only studying what you don't know. And that saves kids a lot of time. And because for our kids of, with that are path of least resistance, this technique um, they like because it doesn't take that long and they're only studying what they don't know. All right, I mentioned earlier this concept of Quizlet and how popular it is for kids. Um, many of you know might know what Quizlet is. It's kind of like a modern take on old fashioned flashcards. And what's neat about Quizlet is that hundreds of thousands of kids have used it over the years. And so let's say the student is taking AP Bio and the student has a quiz, a vocab quiz on all the words in unit one. Well, it's really easy to go into Quizlet and to find the flashcards. These are electronic flashcards that somebody already made. So you can just type in AP unit one um, vocab and up will pop multiple lists of kids cards that they've already created. Um, and so oftentimes what happens when kids wanna practice They'll go to Quizlet, they'll find somebody else's card deck, and they'll start quizzing themselves using somebody else's information. And that is fine, but it's not, it's not as helpful because you're not making your brain work hard. You haven't um, created the deck yourself. So often what we do is we really encourage kids to create their own deck. Um, even if they just do some of the words they don't know, and they create those words into their own deck, it's super helpful because now this is your own information. And instead of just reading it, 
Um, now you have the kinesthetic part of actually making your cards. And what's neat about Quizlet is that there are other features to it that kids don't always use. But let's say um, that you have your own card deck or you're using somebody else's. You can add audio notes to each card. So if you have the word and the definition, you can also maybe add a story to it where you talk the story or um, you use it in context and you clip that audio note to the card. So now you already have it. You have it auditorily as well. And another feature I like um, that will often play with kids or teach them how to use this feature of Quizlet is to turn it into a game. And so with your cards, Quizlet will ask you if you want to play a particular game and now all of a sudden you're moving the cards around, um, you're answering questions and it's becoming kind of kinesthetic. So it makes learning a lot easier. So I shared with you ways that kids can take their base preference, add a few more things to it, even if they're path of least resistance kids and they can study smarter. Um, so Jennifer, I'd love to bring you back into it. And I'd like to talk about other um, troubleshooting things or other issues that you have from parents, and then we'll discuss each one of them. So let's start with the first one. This is super common. Um, I know parents ask you about this, and I also hear it from parents on webinars. Yes, this is a very common question. So Anne, uh, once and for all, is music helpful or harmful while we're studying? Um, <laughs> Well, I will say in general, uh, if music is distracting in the form that the kids are listening to lyrics or they're trying to memorize something from the song, the words from the song, it's inherently distracting because you're listening to the lyrics and you're trying to study for your history test, your focus is split. Um, so we know through lots of studies that in general, music isn't extremely helpful. It is, however, for a small cohort of kids with ADHD, um, there have been a few studies that shown music is actually really helpful to some students. But in general, when we're answering this question or we're talking to kids about it, we might, and they're insistent on music. And a lot of them have had music in the background for many years. And if you try to say, let's do it a different way, it does not work. And so we'll ask them, you know, let's, try it a couple of ways. Um, you know, what if you listen to music tonight and then tomorrow night you didn't? How is that different? Sometimes they'll say it was actually helpful not having the music on. But most of the time, you know, kids still want music. And so we might help them make a, a playlist, like a homework playlist. And so this is music that's either super familiar where they're not listening to the lyrics anymore or um, it doesn't have lyrics at all. It's just instrumental music. So that type of background music where it's more like white noise tends to be fine for students. Thank you. Ah, another question. Um, how can digital distractions be reduced when homework is done online? It's a fan favorite question. I know. Uh, this is the hardest one, I have to say. And how do you, what do you do when you're a parent and, you know, your child's going to supposed to be studying for that history test and, you, you know, you look over their shoulder and they're um, watching YouTube videos. You know, it, it was so much easier when kids just had paper and pencil and didn't have all of these distractions. But the reality is distractions are twofold. Certainly there's other tabs you can be looking at at your laptop. And now you also have your phone, so it's a double whammy. So I'll take, I'll start with the phones. Um, you know, oftentimes kids will say, oh, I have to have my phone to do my homework, but typically that's not correct. They don't always need to have their phone there. It's just kind of a, you know, something that, that they've done for so long. Um, so that I can share with you the research, set, what the research says and also the reality. But what we know is that, you know, anytime we have our phone right with us, we're, it's just a natural distraction because we're looking at it. We want to see what's going on. Um, but there was a study done at Stanford. This was with college students showing that when kids had their phone for 20 minutes in the other side of the room or in a different room where it wasn't right in front of them, 
called a tech break. That was actually really helpful to limit distractions. So when we work with kids, we'll say, you know, what if you try to be a detective to see if this is helpful to you? Because often kids know it's a distraction, but they can't help it. I mean, we all do that. So often it's, you know, when there's a big test or when you really want to get something down, done, um, could this work for you? Do you want to try it and see how it goes? So sometimes it might be, ideally it's 20 minutes off and then checking it and 20 minutes off again in another place, but it might just be trying it out for 10 minutes. So that's a phone. Um, with the laptop, often when we talk to kids about it, they'll say, you know, I know I'm before I know it, I'm down this rabbit tube of watching videos. Um, and I know I shouldn't be doing that, but it's hard to drag yourself. It's hard for me to drag myself out of it. And so we often recommend um, website blockers and they're, they come in two different forms. One is where you can blacklist websites that you don't want to go to because you know that these are distracting to you, or you can whitelist the websites you want to go to. So for example, Stay Focused is a Chrome extension um, that allows you to do this and you can pick how long you don't want access to particular sites, say 20 minutes. We encourage kids, you know, about 25 minutes is about right. Um, and that way you're, you're really going to be focused on what you need to do. And whether you try to restart your computer or disable the app, you can't get to those other websites. So this is not something I would recommend for a parent to just go and put on their child's computer because it will create lots of tension and arguments. But instead, it's a discussion. Could this help you? It may help you. It might not. Is it something that you want to try? And what we found over the years is although we have lots of strategies for um, helping kids to be better at math, at writing, um, be more organized, manage their time better, ultimately, if they can be part of the equation, if they have buy-in and they think it's part of their idea, they're much more likely to follow through on it. So let's see, the next one, Jennifer. Oh, another favorite. Um, how do I know if my child's study habits are adequate? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I'm commonly asked, how do we know if our study habits are working? How do we know if it's enough? Are we doing the right things? Um, and we're, you know, parents are really curious and so are students to know or what, you know, most of the time a student is saying, well, I'm doing this, that's good. And the parent is saying, well, but in the, you know, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, but I, I think it's not enough. I think that there's something I'm missing. Um, and so, you know, in various forms, I hear this question quite a bit. Yeah, and I think we talked about this just briefly before. One of the litmus tests for is what you're doing adequate is test grades. And I know that everything shouldn't be related to test grades, but the common theme, whether you have kids of la um, least resistance or kids that study a lot is, the, is a test as a barometer. So, you know, what we often see is that sometimes kids, even the ones that are working hard, they'll do well on um, things like projects. They do well on homework. They do well on class participation. If they don't get a good grade, they'll go into their teacher. They'll study again and they'll retake the test. But if you're seeing with your child that at, at, on their initial take of the test, if they're not doing well, and this isn't just, you know, every once in a while, because everybody has a great, bad grade every once in a while. But if you're seeing consistently tests are the issue, that's a sign that maybe study habits aren't buttoned up very well. Um, and that's the same with kids that don't want to put forth a ton of effort. We can help them too, because it might just be that they just need to spend a tiny bit more time, not a lot more time but they can get a better bang for their buck, especially if they're not the ones that aren't doing well on tests. So often test scores are the barometer about study habits. Thank you. Ooh, this is a favorite question for so many of our parents that, that have resistant kids, but how can parents handle a resistant, uh, a child resistant to help or support? Sure. Um, 
you know, this is common. I know you hear this when parents call the office. They're like, wow, this sounds really great. I'm not sure if my child will do this. I'm not sure if I can get my child to buy in. Is that what you often hear, Jennifer? Yes. Uh, many, many times uh, discussing where kids are at in their, their stages of change. Yeah. And so um, it's common, you know, as parents, we see that there's an issue, um, but we also know that our child is resistant to change. And quite frankly, a lot of kids that aren't doing well, or they might be actually doing okay, they're kind of like B students, but, um, and they, they certainly could be doing better. Um, but when we put too much pressure, they kind of get into avoidance mode. They avoid us as parents, they avoid doing the work, um, they kind of retreat. And so when that happens and kids, you know, are exhibiting, are having issues that need to be worked on, they are somewhere on this ladder of behavior change. And this actually comes from the trans theoretical model of behavior change. When as human beings, we want to change a behavior, it could be that it has nothing to do with school. Like we want to exercise more or we want to lose weight. We go through these stages of change. Um, and so sometimes people approach the behavior that they want to change um, in the middle and they see that they have this big problem and they're really motivated to fix it. But a lot of times, especially with kids, they come to us at the very bottom of the stages of change. Like, look at this first one. It's called pre-contemplation. They're like not even really thinking about it. And they'll say, um, you know, oh, like, let's say the problem is that they don't write down their assignments. And sometimes their teachers post it. Sometimes they don't. There's inconsistency from posting. And so the student really does need to write down what they have to do. And sometimes kids will say, no way, it's not a problem. I can remember. Um, this isn't an issue for me. I'm not going to do anything about it. And I'm not going to change. Um, sometimes they're at the step above that. Like, yeah, you're right. It, it is kind of like, yeah, sometimes I don't remember the stuff, but it's not that bad. Um, preparation is, you know what? I do see that it's a problem and I'm really going to try a, a new way. And I'm, I'm going to start this tomorrow. Um, Action is when the student has already taken action. Yep, I know. Um, I'm working on this. These are the things I'm doing. And then maintenance is when they found a way around this and they, they're they doing that on a regular basis. So kids come to us at all different stages. And we use um, an assessment. And this is really helpful for parents to know whether even if you're just talking to your child, because sometimes what we see as a problem the kid doesn't see as a problem. And if we try to help them with that issue and they don't see it, they're, they're gonna resist all the help in the world. So with the student self-assessment, we've boiled it down to study habits that kids need to have. And we wanna identify where they are in the stages of change with, with each habit. So for example, number three is when it comes to recording my daily assignments and then there's different levels. Like I, you know, this isn't a problem at all to, yeah, I totally agree. This is a problem. I need to fix it. Um, so with each skill, we see where they are. So the skills where they're at the very bottom at pre-contemplation, we're not going to go there right away. We want to figure out where is it that they're willing to accept some help. And that is the way in for a resistant child. Um, because ultimately when we work with kids and as parents too, you want to earn trust. If it's always contentious, it's not going to work. So the first step is to see where the child will accept help, where they're going to get, you're going to get more buy-in um, and you can earn trust. And, and that's really the way to go with a resistance student. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm sure you guys can see the QR code. Um, I would love to chat with you guys. Um, as Anne stated before, I speak with so many families um, and I would love to chat with you about yours. Um, so if you would like to schedule a consultation, I you know, want to learn a little bit more about your child and if we're a good match for each other, we would love to work with you. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. And thank you everybody for joining us. We're going to go to Q&A in just a second. Um, if you have a question about your child, I will answer it in the chat right now. But um, if you'd like to reach out to me or Jennifer, we're here for you. And we'd love to have a conversation with you. 
All right, so let's go to Q and A's. And after questions, I um, have a survey that's gonna pop up. And if you would be so kind as to take that survey at the end, I would so appreciate it. All right, so let's see. Um, <laughs> Catherine says, I am listening and knitting right now. It helps me to focus. That's awesome, Catherine. I'm glad that you've identified that about yourself. That's terrific. Um, and thank you, Melissa, for offering, for putting in Quizlet and the Learning Scientists. I love Learning Scientists. So thank you for putting that in. All right. So Megan says, um, I've often heard about Anki. It uses spaced repetition and digital card packs that the user makes. Has anyone tried Anki? And if so, what did you think? Oh, thank you for that, Megan. Let's see if anybody mentions that. Um, Gail says, I had a teacher who encouraged music in the background for memory association, even studying, and I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Gail. Uh, that may be hard for you. I, it's hard for me. You know, when I'm driving and I get lost, the first thing I do is turn off the radio. Um, I can't listen to anything else. I just have to focus. And if you're that type of person, um, meaning, you know, like when you have to work on something really hard, you don't like any noise around you, you're probably the type of person that doesn't do well with music. Whereas if you're the type of person that likes to sit themselves in the middle of Starbucks to get something done, um, you're probably the person that likes the hum of a busy area. And you may be the person who can tolerate music in the background. And it kind of gives you that ump, um, that little extra push of motivation. Dorothy says, for a third grader with spelling tests every two weeks, What's the best way to learn spelling tests? My son is mainly a kinesthetic learner and I base this on him loving Lego building. You know, often with spelling tests, um, we ask our kids the word, okay, spell fidget. And we ask the student to spell it auditorily to us. But we always want kids to practice for a test in the way that they're going to have the test. So obviously a spelling test is paper and pencil. So that's the way you want to do it. You know, ask them, um, practice each day um, if you want, you know, maybe five words with him writing it down, not auditorily. And um, that's one way to do a little bit every day. Or you can start out by asking him all the words. He takes a little test. Then it's kind of like the Leitner method. Pull out the ones he doesn't know and leave the other ones alone and just practice the ones he doesn't know um, every other day or every day or whatever you want to do, whatever rhythm you can get in with spelling. Other things we've done is um, with kids that are kinesthetic, they can, you can ask them the word, they write it and they trace it three times or to have friction, get a crayon and have them trace it with a crayon because then you're getting that friction on the paper and that helps kinesthetic learners or it helps kids that like to touch and feel things, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, would you mention the Chrome extension again? Yes, and it is. Oh, you mentioned that, um, Melissa. It's Stay Focused. Um, there's a lot of them. Like if you have a Mac, there's one called Self Control that I like as well. And then there's one um, called, I believe it's Focus Booster. And it's based on this idea um, called the Pomodoro Technique that a person, especially middle, high school kids, definitely college students, that 25 minutes is really a sweet spot for focus. So anytime you're trying to learn something by yourself and it's more than 25 minutes, that's when you're more likely to get distracted or your mem your mind drifts. Um, so Focus Booster is a website blocker, but it does it only in increments of 25 minutes based on the Pomodoro method. And I like that one too. Um, Jen says, my son is very auditory when it comes to learning and studying. I always have to verbally quiz him and talk about the material when studying. He's in seventh grade now. How do I encourage him to study more independently? And what can things can I have him to do? Um, so I would have the discussion with him and say, um, you know, what are ways that you could study independently? How about if we work on this for 15 minutes together? And then you work on this for 15 minutes on your own. And what I would have him do is to take his notes or the study guide and, and 
quiz himself. So he doesn't need you for that. He can quiz himself by just covering and looking. Um, or he could be looking at his notes and then asking himself, why is that important? And then jotting that down. So I would keep it super short. Don't say, well, you're, you know, you're in seventh grade. You should be able to do this by now because he's dependent on you for a while. So that cold turkey approach typically doesn't work. So instead say, let's work on this for 15 minutes together. And then how about you do this for 15 minutes? Um, what are some ways that could work for you? And maybe try out that self-testing method. Amir says, any guidance on motivating kids to study? It seems that my kids are not motivated to study or do their homework with frequently missed assignments. You know, Amir, sometimes when kids don't have a pain point, um, they may not want to do anything in addition, like studying. Sometimes kids see that homework is actually something that they're required to do, or they have an essay they have to turn in, a book report to write, um, a lab report that they have to turn in, and they're willing to do those things, but they don't see studying as something that they have to do. And this is especially true if there's not a pain point. So if the student is already doing really well um, or pretty well, they may see like, I'm doing well enough without studying. They don't have any pain associated with it. So they don't want to do it. And that's the hardest thing. If your child doesn't have a pain point to get them to, to do something that they don't want to do. So that's where I might ask, you know, let's talk about this. Um, it, you could break it down in two ways. One is, um, tell me what you might do. You know, what do you have coming up? Have you studied for this yet? What's one small thing you can do? So just having the discussion. And then the other one is, if the if what I'm saying isn't correct, and they are, there is a pain point, the grades are poor, but they're still not willing to study, that's when I might bring somebody else in. Because it could be that sometimes when the parent says it, there is friction in the relationship. And I found that as parents, the more we push, the more kids push back. And if we're getting a lot of pushback, that's a sign that maybe we're not the best person in the mix and finding somebody else outside. So, you know, of course that's what we do, but it could be the college student down the street. It could be staying after school with the teacher for extra help. All of those things can be meaningful. Um, Carrie, thanks for the Chrome link. Got, glad you got it. Um, let's see. My child reads at a slower pace. She is taking too many high school AP classes with large workloads. Any thoughts of how she can work towards becoming a faster reader or consumer of information? Um, yes. So Sarah, thank you for that question. We see this a lot when kids are kind of overscheduled and they're taking classes that aren't in line with um, what they're able to keep up with. So there's certainly a method for skimming and scanning. And that means before the student starts to read in the first place, they have to get a, a, gr a grip on what they're about to read. And this is the number one strategy for comprehension. Before you even start, you need to be asking yourself, what am I about to read? What's important here? Um, or why do I have to know this? That means you read the title, you read the subtitles, um, you look at the pictures, you get a sense of what you're going to read before you start. And just by doing that and having an anchor point, you're going to be able to read a little faster because you're going to understand what you need, what you're doing. So for, for high level work, although you can read a little bit faster, if you, if you just need to get through it, that's fine. But if you also need to retain it, then I would recommend that faster may not be where it's at, that still jotting down notes in the columns is going to be really helpful. Um, you know, also in AP classes, we think of it as big picture. Um, so why do I have to know this is um, a really important question. Why is this important in the context of what we're learning in this class? And when kids can answer that, they usually do better on DBQs because they're able to consolidate the information and they say the reason behind it. So I might have your daughter um, preview what she's about to read 
And even if it slows you down just a tad, taking the time to jot down notes can be helpful for long-term retention and then using weekends really well and taking time on the weekends to do some of the work so that the weekdays aren't so stressful. Can you talk more about hands-on learning? I feel that traditional school is difficult for my son and I wonder if the approach here at school is why the US doesn't produce enough science majors. Um, certainly, you know, you're right, Sonal, that um, often when we teach science, although there is some hands-on, a lot of it is book work too. And sometimes kids um, do better, kids will do better in different types of environments. So when, although you can't control really what's going on in class, at home, you can make sure that he's up and doing his work. Maybe he's standing up and doing his homework. Maybe when he has to study something, he's not sitting down and he puts the information on post-it notes and he categorizes them on the wall. So he's up and moving and using his hands. He's sorting flashcards. Um, with younger students, I've often done things like had a beach ball and thrown them a beach ball and asked them a question. They answer the question and they throw it back to me. I throw it back to them. So sometimes practicing with hands-on ways makes helps kids that like to use that modality makes learning a little bit easier for them. Um, my son is in fourth grade and I've been thinking about getting him a tutor to focus on building study skills. At what age should students start to develop strong study skills? Well, usually in fourth grade, kids don't have too much homework, but they still do have quizzes and they may have a test or they might have something, a book report, and you can still build study skills. You can also build homework skills. And there's something to be said about a process for homework, like, okay, at first I write my name, then I have to interpret the directions. This is the way in which the best way to read directions. Um, and so teaching kids that there's a process behind everything that you do is really helpful. And that in itself is a type of study skill. Um, Delanda said a whiteboard or a sand table. Yes, yes, yes. It's also great for kids practicing spelling words. And I love that, Delanda. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, I love whiteboards. I think they're the best $5 thing you can buy for your child because um, it's something that kids like that are kinesthetic and they kind of get kids off their computers. Um, whiteboards are really fun because you get to write and you get to erase and they're just, they're like magic for kids. I'm not sure why, but when I used to tutor a lot, I always kept whiteboards in my bag and I'd bring them to every child's home because it was just something kids like doing. Um, now for kids study areas, as they get older, I found whiteboards to be super helpful because they can use it for their to-do list. And it's great, they can cross it off or they can erase it um, and they always see it in front of them. Uh, Chris says, anxiety levels went up during COVID. Do you incorporate anything into tutoring to give kids self-help on a casual basis? And yeah, you know, we see that kids certainly are more anxious than ever. Um, in fact, we just had a webinar, or we just had a, um, a psychologist come in to work with our tutors on this topic, talking about test anxiety. And we've seen this, you know, anxiety about everything, but anxiety certainly in the form of, of tests in schools more than ever. And I thought that was really helpful. One thing that I found to be uh, helpful for anxious kids is really hearing them out and not saying things like, don't worry, it's gonna be okay, or don't worry about that, or there's nothing to worry about. Like those things do not all work for an anxious student. Instead, it's, you know what? I can see why you're worried about this. You're right. You know, this is a tough assignment or yeah, it, you're right, it is a big deal. Um, but I have confidence that you can, um, that you can control your feelings around this issue. Let's talk about it. So we may not have confidence that they can get an A on the test, but we have confidence that they can they they can you know prepare well or they can feel calm before they take the test. And one way you could do that when it comes to test taking is to encourage your child to write out all their worries before they start to take the test. 
um, this is a this was a study done at University of Chicago looking at what do you do with anxious kids in a test taking situation, um, and they found that if kids had a little journal um, or even on the back of their test right before they took their test, if they wrote out all the things that they are worried about, like I'm worried that if I don't get an A, a B on this test, I won't get an A for the semester, or I'm worried that my mom will be mad at me, or whatever their worries are. If you can get your worries out before you take the test, those kids did it just as well as their non-anxious peers. So I believe it's the same thing when we're talking to kids. Instead of dismissing them, um, don't worry about that. We want to say, you know what, you're right. Um, I can tell you're concerned. I can tell you're frustrated. I can tell you're worried. Um, let's talk about it. And then, you know what, I, I have faith. I have, the conf I have confidence that you're going to be able to control um, how you feel in this situation. So those kinds of things can help. All right, last question, and then we'll call it a night from Irene. My daughter is a resistant type and gets defensive when we talk about homework and grades. She, she feels like she puts a lot of effort, but the results don't match the effort. She is resistant to our help is an, and is increasingly resistant to tutors that we set up for her. How can we turn this around to get her to care more so that she can seek help on her own will. Um, it might be Irene that she hasn't quite met the right person yet. It could be that um, just kind of like a therapist, sometimes when kids go to, or adults go to see a therapist, the first one or two aren't quite a match. But I do believe, um, you know, if she can, she might be low on the stages of change, but if we can find the area in which she's willing to get help, it may not be, you know, with homework, it might be something else. Um, but there may be a way in through using that little questionnaire and figuring out where she's willing to accept help. And that's probably the best way in for her because she's resistant um, from past experiences. And then having somebody that she feels super comfortable with on her side um, may be just the ticket. All right. Um, let's see, one real, really quick one um, from Gail. My son is in 11th grade. I'm in my 50s and he is behind in using cyber, cyber high to catch up. He's open to my helping, but I tend to want to take over. I know I need help in this area. My eldest son had no problems in academics and I was an honor student myself. I don't know how to help my 16 year old. So yes, you know, when we see kids struggling, Gail, our first inclination is to dive in and want to help them. And I'm not going to say back up, to back off totally, because that may not work in a situation. If he is behind, I would set up a time to talk to him about what's happening. You know, what is the class he's behind in? Um, is it multiple classes? And it might be that, um, you know, figuring out which class it is, um, asking to talk to the teacher, emailing her, figuring out which assignments can be forgiven and which ones he really has to do, and then helping him put together a list, or ideally, we call this calendaring, figuring out the steps he needs to take and putting those um, pieces of information, those little small steps to getting things done in his calendar. So starting small, asking him what's one thing that you can do today, What's one small step you can take? What's something small you can do to get started may help him once you figure out what exactly he has to do. But honestly, um, given his age and that fact that he's behind, I would offload it to somebody else. We see kids like this all the time. Um, kids come to us. Like we had a kid recently who had like 30 overdue assignments and um, we negotiated some of them so he didn't have to do all of them. But then the rest we figured out based on priority, like which ones counted the most for his grade. And then we prioritized those and we started to chip away, take those big things, break them down to small things and chip away at getting them done. So if you don't feel like you can accomplish that with him, I might hire somebody else to do that um, so that he's able to get on top of things again. All right, so thank you everybody so much for being with us tonight, Jennifer. Thank you um, for being a part of the webinar and sharing your insights from parents. 
I appreciate all of you. I wish you all a wonderful evening and enjoy the rest of your school year. Take care. Bye-bye.